In this episode of the Business Growth Podcast, I'm interviewing Tanner Kill Carson, and we're talking about how he does international business and specifically how he hires his international employees. We're also going to get into the details of developing the business culture, and that works for both a virtual environment and for a physical environment. We're also going to talk about the warning signs of burnout and how you can avoid those warning signs because they will absolutely destroy the business that you're setting up. And lastly, we're also talking about e-commerce and why it's so hot. So stay tuned, listen to this interview, and pull out all this valuable information to help you grow your business. Hey Tanner, I'm super excited that we got together today. Uh, Yesterday we did a pre-call interview and right before we hung up, you took off to the gun range to uh, go shoot a shotgun and be outside. And so super respectful there that you're uh, following some of your passions. And so what we want to do is talk about business, uh, talk about the fun things that you've done. You've lived in the Middle East and yesterday's pre-interview, you shared some pretty amazing things. So let's uh, let's open up, find some ways that we can help the uh, listeners grow their businesses, uh, share some stories that will excite them and help them go through that transformation process. So welcome to the interview. Well, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, Spencer. Thanks so much for having me here. Yesterday was definitely fun. Uh, you're, yeah, yeah, I mean, as much as I may have had adventures, you're a really cool guy. I mean, look at the, look at behind you, <laughs> all the very amazing guitars that you told me about. So very cool. Well, thanks, man. Um, well, let's start out Middle East. That was that was the part that got me thinking yesterday. Okay. Um, the Middle East is a different world from, and I haven't been there yet. And you're sharing with me things that blew my mind. So the first car that people get there isn't a Toyota; it's a Mercedes. And people are running up bar tabs uh, the size of most mortgages. And um, and business is big there. So let's jump into starting about the Middle East. Let's talk about that and how business is done there. And then maybe how people in North America, Western civilization, can adopt some of those higher, bigger thinking. Well, the Middle East is a, is a phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's fantastic because what seemingly popped out of nowhere out of the desert and places like Dubai where I was, um, there's just so much opportunity and it's, it promises the opportunity. And when you arrive, it's completely different than what you thought. You know, you, you get there and you see all the glamor and the glitz and you think, Christ, there's a lot of money here. How is this happening? And you really sort of want to delve into that. Um, and it's, I believe what the U S wanted to be as a land of opportunity, but I think the middle East truly is because now we're in a modern version of what the U S wanted to be back in the old days. Uh, you've got technology, tons of opportunity. There's just so much land if you're into physical business. There's a lot of stuff going on and the uh, various Arab cultures in the Middle East and uh, non-Arab cultures, because not all Arabs per se. Uh, there's just so many different cultures you got to deal with and learn. So uh, I would say that if you look at Dubai, for example, just as one of the examples in the last uh, 10 years, uh, it's definitely something that people should take note of. Why did so many Western expats or expats in general, you know, head there in droves? As my, I was one of them as well. And, and what, imagine what happens in those places. The tallest building in the world, the seven-star hotels, the palm-shaped islands. It's, it's craziness. It's mad. There's money. If we could recognize it for what it is, uh, we should all be there to do some level of business. So it's ridiculously expensive there. Um, I wouldn't say ridiculously expensive. Out of my experience, there are certain things that are expensive. For example, like the startup of a company. Um, initial startup costs can be quite uh, cameras, computers, things like that. But uh, when I think about cars, for example, I, I the first car I ever had there, not a rental, the first car I ever had when I in 2007 was a Mercedes. It's standard for people to buy nicer things. But when I compared the price to in Canada, uh, it was the same dollar value. It was just easier for somebody living in Dubai to get one simply because we're tax-free income. Okay. Yeah. So what's the advantage of starting up a business in Dubai? Uh, well, you've got... Uh, made not just Dubai, because when you're doing business out of Dubai, you tend to do it amongst the uh, Gulf Cooperative uh, Country Council countries. There's GCC. It's about seven countries there. Uh, so you pretty much gain access to these nations where a lot of new business ideas are just entering that marketplace, like payment gateways, um, you know, different kinds of web services, web directories, rating services, deal sites. There's just so many opportunities out there, including physical businesses like restaurant chains and so on. Um, 
but is it crazy expensive to start those? Yes. I'll actually tell you how much it costs me to have a, a web development company there and then compare it to how much it costs to have it in Canada, for example. Um, in Dubai, I've just got my renewal notice. So in Dubai, it's going to cost me just to register a web design company, uh, just under 10,000 US dollars. Wow. That's simply the registration. And uh, in Canada, the registration for the same type of business is $135. Okay, that's a little bit of a difference. Yeah. Major, yeah. yeah. But then the amount, sheer amount of opportunity there sometimes outweighs that initial startup cost. And, um, and you're seeing a lot of amazing businesses come out of the Middle East right now. Okay. Now, the opportunity. Tell us about the, the bigger thinking. I mean, there's, you know, obviously the cost that you can charge for a website in Canada is mm-hmm. going to be quite a difference in Dubai. How do business owners, yeah. consultants, how does everyone think differently there than they do here? Um, there's a lot of competition out in North America. It's a far more established region in terms of web design, development, uh, freelancers, e-commerce. All of these things have been here in North America for quite some time. Um, and when you move that philosophy over to the Middle East, we have to remember that it's not just building a business and then there it goes. The, co- the community as a whole has to understand things like online payments. So they have to be trained and taught over a period of time. So there's that sort of lag period between developing the technology, but then having it introduced to the public and then getting the public to use it. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I had a conversation with uh, uh, somebody from PayPal. They do 50% cash on delivery still on PayPal. And that's that was a huge number. This is in 2011, I believe, the last time that conversation happened. Uh, for me, being from Canada and from you from the States, I mean, we're used to online purchases. Mm-hmm. They're just, they're just becoming used to it. And not because it's online, but because there's a trust factor sometimes. They don't trust the whole credit card on the internet concept. Um, you know, would, why would I want to give you my details in case you steal my money? And there's that scarcity model sometimes still happening. And it could be attributed to the cultural background. It could be attributed to the speed at which our type of business has arrived in their land and all of a sudden everything has changed what seemingly overnight. So there is that, you know, period between zero to hero when they finally take up all of what we consider normal. But I mean, that region has picked up extremely quickly since I was there in 2007. There's just so much going on. So tell me what it was like in 2007, you got a corporate gig. I did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so you entered into that world of going corporate, um, from our conversation, you had a pretty hefty salary. You managed a lot of people, fired a lot of people, and then took a company and did a complete turnaround. Tell us about that. How did you get that turnaround? Because, you know, maybe our, our listeners can be in a similar situation. And to be able to share with them the story of the turnaround is really helpful. Um, I think quite a lot of it has to do with mindset of the people that we all work with and the culture that we decide to create around us. You can see companies who just don't have the right business culture. Um, whereas, for example, a company like Mind Valley, my friend Vishen Lakiani, is one of the top 50 companies in the world to work for and with. And so what I, what I decided to do was, since I was running this division of this uh, media company, um, they were not generating over a million dollars even yet at this point and annually. And how I was able to take it to just over $5 million a year was simply by recreating a culture that I wanted to work in where people had complete control over their own destiny within the work environment. So when I hired, I hired based on what I thought their personality types were and how well they'll all mesh together. So I had, for example, a religious Muslim Egyptian who had a family background, and then I hired a Lebanese non-religious partier type. But I knew that they could mesh because they literally just had the drive and motivation to start something of their own. And when you're talking about a sales organization, each of these people are entrepreneurs. And if we treat them like anything else, uh, they will not succeed because we will have controlled their creative ability. Uh, the renewals team, for example, for that particular product that we were running online, uh, I hired a friend into that to run that. And it became a phenomenal, you know, I, I don't mind hiring friends. I'll agree to that right now because I know what they're like and how they work. It doesn't have to be a stranger. I just know their work ethic and how they, you know, put their head down and uh, work in a determined kind of way. So we grew it together. It wasn't just myself. I led it first. And then when I, when I stepped back from a process like that and I let, I let these guys take control, it was phenomenal to watch how the team went from, you know, one salesperson, three salespeople, five renewals people. Before you know it, we have a whole bigger division again and we generate money. Um, we've also had great skills in the team. 
because you've got marketing people that know exactly what to do, how to do it for that market. But literally, it was motivating my team to, um, uh, you know, to do the to do the right thing for the business. Forget about me. Of course, I led it, but we all went out to dinners and we all went out to, you know, what we needed to do as groups. Um, I simply just respected them because I hired them for what they have as a skill set. So I let them have that. Um, and of course I was also working in the model. So I sold, I mean, I don't believe that a CEO should just walk back or a vice president should just step away from the process. Everyone sells for every company. And if people don't get that, they're losing every opportunity to make money. Yeah. You got to lead from the front. So yeah. the, one of the first things that you said is that you helped with their mindset. Yeah. And oftentimes in these interviews, I hear the importance of mindset and really how that is, um, like the the main foundational piece. So what did you do to help with their mindset? Um, well, first I needed to understand them because I have to, I have to agree with the fact that I had just moved from London, England at that time. So I was surrounded by Brits and British culture and a European way of thinking and a slightly North American way of thinking. When I moved to the Middle East, the Arab world, this, this thing that we all somehow believe there's wars and there's negativity and stuff and religion that we don't understand I let them be who they were. So I had a Lebanese person. I had to understand how Lebanese people think and work. I had an Egyptian. I had South African. I had different kinds of people. And so the idea was to first understand them. So it actually started with my mindset to say, you know what? Forget everything I've ever learned about these people. I don't know anything. And then I let them teach me, which allowed me to understand the areas within the business environment that we must improve um, and the strengths that they have so that they can go and flourish within that. And uh, today, for example, um, you know, the, the, the first person that I hired, Tarek, which a phenomenal guy, you know, his English was funny. His dress code was funny. He was this funny looking guy, whatever. And his, even his Arabic was not that great, you know, whatever. And he's now, he became in 2011, 12, the number one, in all of the company around 6,000 people. He was wrote, they voted number one salesperson. Wow. Uh, it's, it's because we allowed him to be him. I mean, he sold his own way. He did his own way. As long as I set a structure that he could, you know, make his calls and, do what he needs to do. I just let him off and do what he did. And he became the, one of the top salespeople. And even during my management period, he was the top salesperson above and beyond me. Uh, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. So, I didn't hire him to do something else. I hired him to sell and I wanted him to do it. So, with but his, he did it in an Arab way. Sorry. He did it in his way. Do you know what I mean? Way? Like, Lebanese way. And I needed to understand that. And I needed to understand that he understood, for example, Saudi people. I didn't realize that there was a great link between the way he operates and the way Saudi people think. So I sent him to Saudi all the time instead of sending maybe myself or someone else. I may have come across a little too North American. So understanding their cultural differences, it was a long process for me because we had conflict. You know, it was difficult, but it was also a change in me as well. It was being out there. Can you still get the same result with a virtual company? Uh, well, yeah. Why not? Because... If, if, for example, the passion is in me, how do I, the biggest question and I've seen this all over LinkedIn over the last six months, how do you transfer that passion to other people in your business who don't own the business, for example? And I believe that it's actually giving them ownership of it. They must feel like they own what they do. And um, this is the tough part. So whether it's online, virtual, which I've run that kind of business as well, or to physical, you know, bricks and mortar style business, uh, why was Starbucks so successful? Because everybody had that belief in themselves mm -hmm. and what Starbucks really meant and that culture, it, you know, it developed as well. So you can do that in any business model. Um, communication becomes a complexity if you're talking to people from other regions of the world. Uh, for example, I have people in the Philippines or India. I don't understand the full Filipino culture, but I try to. So it's my job. The onus is on me to get what they're thinking and doing and how they work so that I can understand how to transfer my knowledge to them in the best and easiest way and my wants for the business so that they could want that too. But I can't force, you know, I was taught by a mentor. I said, you can't push your rope up a hill. So one of the most important things business owners must consider overseas businesses, online business, offline businesses is you hire slow, you fire fast. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing. The mentality must, must be there. So if that person doesn't fit into the full culture and it does, it causes friction, they just don't belong there. And we need to be able to make and understand these decisions quickly. What are the essential hires in a business? Essential hires? Mm -hmm. So how do you mean like an essential? Like, uh, who, who are the essential people that you would hire? Would it be a salesperson? Would it be a marketing, uh, PR? Who do you think it would be? Uh, sort of a broad question because you're looking at the type of business it is. Uh, I run more virtual business. So in, 
in virtual, I love salespeople. I've been in sales 16 years myself. Salespeople are adaptive. Um, they tend to show the type of skills that you want because they can talk the talk. They usually look the look, walk the walk. But at the same time, they're motivated and because they're motivated by money, um, you know, they're one of my top choices for people to get into an organization. But you need some structure, uh, someone to tie that all together. And a leader, if it's going to be a small business, an SME, uh, must be that, must be the glue that binds everyone. But I, I love salespeople. Um, online, of course, I must have an IT person. Someone must run the back end of these things. It's not going to be me. Because again, as the owner of a business, I although I could sell for it, but I need to do it at a high level and meet other business owners to attract more joint ventures, more potential clients, uh, at which point they could close those deals. But I love salespeople and IT, of course. But I think I'm biased because I'm sales and I, I love the web. So okay, I'm not going to say don't hire an HR person or something. I love them too, but... <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, now, you've been in corporate structure. You've had... Uh, you know, the actual brick and mortar type of businesses and then virtual. What's your favorite? <laughs> well, who doesn't want to, you know, spend more of their time at gun ranges and at the beach? So yeah, virtual. Um, I do miss parts of the corporate structure, but it's more of a social element of it. Uh, because I, everybody has to understand that whether you're virtual or not, there is a corporate structure there as well. You have management, you have people that run things, and then you have people that, create content, for example, and then sell things. So there is a structure no matter what. I'm just, I, I prefer online. I prefer the ability to have uh, the freedom to roam as I work. Okay. Uh, that's a personal choice, of course. What would you say have been some of your greatest failures in business? <laughs> um, wow, investing in uh, time in the wrong space. It's one of the first things that as an entrepreneur, we realize how much of the work we think that we're, we need to do ourselves instead of just giving it to the people who have the skills. Um, so I've lost a uh, business, for example, here in Toronto, uh, promotions businesses, simply because we, um, well, we consumed our profits. One of the worst things in the world. And uh, we had four business partners, non-communicative, major failure in that business. Uh, in Dubai, of course, I've had a number of failures. I've, I've had 28 different product lines most of which just failed and flopped in the market. Um, I don't mind the loss. I mean, without loss, you wouldn't have the experience, right? Were there red flags, uh, warning signs that, that you could have seen that you avoided to actually pay attention to? Yeah, absolutely. One of the first things that um, in a growing business, we need to hire staff that generates content or product. And one of the first things that I should have done in one of my first businesses was that, and it wasn't. And I found that, you know, I was doing all the work. I was the tea boy. I was the, you know, the guy who does the faxes. I was the guy that does the email and I did all the meetings and you burn yourself out. I should have just seen that coming. I should have just spent that 10, 20, $30,000 to just get the right people into the right place and grow the business immediately and organically from inside. Um, that was probably one of my biggest failures for my first business in Dubai that didn't do so well um, or it died. Um, but today my life is not just about company setup. Of course, we'll talk about that with e-commerce, but products creation, I flopped massively because I, d I didn't understand how to create a product, but I should have just hired the staff for it. It's, it's one of the things that entrepreneurs unfortunately try to do everything and we shouldn't. Yeah. I think there's only so many hats that we can wear as an entrepreneur. And yeah. We have to realize that uh, ultimately you want to pull yourself out and become the, the conductor of the orchestra instead of yeah. the technician working on the instrument. Yeah. I, I love being in the business. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, even as Steve Jobs or Bill Gates had been in their own businesses nonstop and they still were in that time. And even Bill Gates today, he's still in his business. Um, I love what I do and I do want to immerse myself in it, but there is no one in the world that does everything alone. And, uh, unfortunately when we love our product so much, um, you know, we can't let it go. And unfortunately we can't share it. It's difficult to share the idea with people because we have this mentality. They might try to take it or, and it becomes a it becomes a silly battle with oneself rather than actually growing a business, and that's why we fail sometimes. Yeah. So let's jump into e-commerce. That's something that you're actually really excited about. Um, I don't want to get too deep into. You have some pretty awesome projects in the works. Uh, I'll let you share what you can, um, <laughs> but pretty impressive. So let's talk about e-commerce. Uh, what you're what you're doing, what's going on, and the things that you're putting in place to make sure that it's going to work out. Um, yeah, I, I love e-commerce. I love the idea that we can manage a store online um, with less overhead than bricks and mortar without having to stock. 
Uh, currently, the kind of e-commerce platforms that I'm working on for myself are drop shipment style where I don't actually touch the products. It's just e- easier um, where I don't have to get involved in the buyer process and stockage. I'm trying to keep the overhead low as much as possible. The one thing I can tell you of one of the projects we're just about to finish, probably will finish this weekend, is um, is in the holistics and well-being industry, which is something that's personal to me because I'm all about juicing vegetables and fruits and eating all healthy and believing in meditation. And um, so it's it's being launched uh, this weekend, hopefully, but we're going to do a silent launch for a few months to build the directory. It's the Middle East's first and only uh, holistic and well-being directory service. Okay. Um, I don't know if I should say the name now, but uh, we'll just reserve it maybe if you want we'll to put pro- it in the description. No problem. Yeah, awesome. And um, and another one in fashion, accessory, and design. So there's just so much opportunity because people are now just buying online more than they ever were, and there's enough statistics and news to uh, you know to support that. Um, so it's it's a beautiful principle. It generates a huge amount of revenue uh, if it's done. It is a massive undertaking what I'm discovering right now because these are my first two e-commerce businesses where I will run them myself and uh, well not myself but run them and uh, what I've learned about e-commerce is phenomenal so if there's anyone watching this consider e-commerce as a business but everyone should sell at whatever they have already online I I Why cannot do you love e-commerce so much well because all of us so out there all of us not just entrepreneurs we've all dreamt of having some business the thing is is that quite often people build a website. And then that's that's it. They sort of put it there, but they've let's say they have tangible products. They don't actually consider selling it right there. So because I've been in sales all my life, I've always been looking for avenues where I can improve my ability to sell a product or something, or even myself as a brand. E-commerce just affords that ability, and it does it very quickly. And these days, e-commerce websites are very cheap right, in terms of price. Uh, they're very quick to put together, and as long as you understand your supply chain. And the customer service aspect of it, um, it can be an easy business to get going. Now, whether it's going to be easy to run, I'm about to find that out right now. Um, why I love it is because the sheer amount of revenue a good e-commerce platform can and a good brand can generate, which allows entrepreneurs the freedom to do other businesses. But how do you actually compete against Amazon and compete against Etsy and places like that? Um I wouldn't compete with them necessarily because their their focus areas are not the same as mine. Uh, for example, if I decide to stick to a, an area in fashion, I can just pick a specific part of the fashion industry. So it doesn't have to be anything in fashion and including interior design. Some of these websites like the Amazons, uh, they just have too much stuff and this is no focus. But if I pick a specific niche, if I pick a specific product line, I can literally focus on that and build that brand around it. And um I won't have to compete. And in some areas, I like to collaborate. So I would not have competition. If I can't supply something, why not just send it to some, what, seemingly a competitor? Um, and then I can collaborate with them in the future because I'll just say thank you very much for handling the customer for me. Uh, and my customer would appreciate that as well. So I'm not really ever in a competitive sense with a, an Amazon-type monster. <laughs> That's actually a really good way to look at it. Um, so for our listeners that have a business let's say they have an online business, which a lot of the listeners do. What what are some of the things that you could point them in the direction that will help them dramatically increase their revenue without increasing their workload? Um, yeah, read. Go to the blogs. Go to all the Twitter and Facebook group uh, posts and Facebook groups and LinkedIn especially because there's a lot of knowledge that are being transferred right now. Buy into programs that relate to growing your business from internet marketers that know what they're doing. So go to some of the big names that are out there that understand this kind of th- uh, thing. Um, you know, how can you do sales if you don't understand lead generation or marketing? Advanced marketing on social media. These are the types of things that people should understand and learn. But hire the right people. If you have the budget, hire the right skills. Um, and outsource your work because you're not an island to yourself. You, you can't do everything as you and I just mentioned. And it will fail if we try to do everything ourselves because our focus will have been taken away. Anyone who hires based on someone that says, yeah, I'm a multitasker, say no. I want you to have a singular focus as the business does. If I sell donuts, all I want to do is sell donuts because other people are selling donuts and coffee and da 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 and they're selling 50 things. Be good at one thing before you can grow into the other areas. Um, and take risks. You know, what quite often. risks? Well, I mean, like right now, for example, you said that a lot of people have an online business, but I believe that a lot of people have a website. It's a business card, and they don't realize that an online business or an online presence requires that they, you know, sell something online. Then it becomes a business. Um, the kind of risk that people should take, 
don't worry about losing what you have simply because you should share your idea with other people. Share it anyway because the kind of knowledge you might gain from that. Unfortunately, and from my experience in the Middle East, they just don't want to talk to each other. They're sort of holding on to these ideas so tight, they never let them go to evolve. And they might not realize how, how small their thought process was around it when they talk to some people and they realize, oh my God, I should have done this much more. and I could have learned this much more. And get a mentor. Don't be afraid of getting a mentor. Get someone to talk to who can enlighten you on things that we can't see. You know, when I look at my um, holistic well-being websites, this uh, directory website, I can't see some of what's going on there because I've been looking at it for weeks, months. And so I need someone from outside to go there and say, no, Tanner, that's not going to work. Here's what you should have thought of. And then it's like, oh, yeah. So expand our minds. And that's kind of risky for people because they don't they think that they know everything. And the, the moment we realize we don't know anything is the moment we start to really learn. So, and do it, you know, just go out and do it. Put the product up. You don't know what's going to happen if it's there for people to consume. How did you get a mentor? Uh, this is a very good question. I believe that I did an episode of this on my TV show, web TV show, sorry. Um, so you look at the big guys, you know, the Tony Robbinses and all these guys that are out there as, as, as you know, business coach mentors. Obviously, there's a level to which startups can't afford their services. So I kind of tend to look at people who are successful, uh, publicly successful in what they do. Uh, and then I just start asking questions. And if they feel like sharing, I'll, I'll get closer and closer and they'll get closer to me. And uh, I literally just open up. But there's no website where you just go get mentors. You have to know, like, and trust the people so that you could be at least into them and into what they do. Um, my suggestion would be find other people that are doing what you're looking to do that are doing it successfully, of course. You don't want to hang out with people who just talk the talk but don't have money in their pockets. You know, you don't take financial advice from a poor guy. Yeah. So find the people that are successful. One of my biggest mentors is a lady that runs an oil and gas magazine in Canada, Tina Oliveira, and she's phenomenal. And why I consider her a mentor, and she allows me to, her industry has nothing to do with mine per se, but she has insights about starting up of businesses, marketing, budgeting. She has things that I didn't understand at first. And she would just openly tell me simply because we have a no like and trust situation between us. So my suggestion is find those people in your circle. Um, if you have no one that you can trust, you're not networking. You're not out there, you know, shaking hands. You're not flat footing it. Get out there and meet people. This is what I'm finding is a difficulty in North America is people are too established in their circles in their own way. Whereas, and I'm not saying everybody, it's not a generalization, but whereas in Dubai, there is networking events in Dubai, but about 50 of them a day. I, I, I didn't have enough business cards at that time when I was pushing business cards into people's hands. I would run out on a, on a like almost a weekly basis. So forget 250 cards. You need a thousand business cards because that's going to run you out in a couple of weeks. So, but through these events, through other business um, startup events, uh, go meet people, mobile companies. I, I'm not, I have nothing to do with the mobile industry per se, but what I learned from the people that are running mobile apps and mobile companies and who invest in these, I learned a lot from simply being around them. And I think the law of attraction states that if you simply just allow yourself and open yourself and surround yourself with this environment, you will find the people that make sense to you. And believe it or not, these mentors are the mentor types. They're not interested in stealing anyone's ideas or putting you down. They're literally just interested in getting you to ask the right questions of yourself. And it actually helps them out in the process, too. It's a learning thing, right? I mean, anybody I've ever helped, and I've helped thousands of people in the conferences I've been to, uh, I learn something through the process. And I take nothing from the people I help because I'm too busy doing my own stuff. I just wish more people would realize that no one's trying to steal anything. They're busy, you know, but they want to help. And helping helps. So pay it forward. That's good. Well, you know what? How can our audience pay it forward to you and say thanks for the interview? <laughs> um, buy my stuff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but... uh you know, the best thing that anyone in the entire world can do is first concentrate on themselves and to get to know thyself, get to understand what you are in your life. There's far too many businesses that are dying. 70 some 70 percent of businesses are dead in their first few six months mm -hmm. in the world. And that's usually because the person went in it looking for money. You know how they can help me help yourself. Don't chase money, chase your dreams. And when your dreams are so big, and I believe I read this in an article a few days ago. When your dreams are so big that no one else is dreaming that, there is no competition at that level. Make your dreams that big. And there are a number of people surrounding me that do. And make the better of yourself. Because as much as I want people to be consumers of my products, I want them to successfully understand why my products are there for them and how it can help them grow. I don't want them to just buy it blindly. I've got all sorts of stuff that I've done. 
what I want them to do, how they can pay forward to me is, yeah, be better at understanding your world. Read, ask people questions. Don't hold anything back because the world already has everything these days. Just improve on it. And, but dream big. Dream big. Okay. Because, but what can I say to your audience that's, you know, that's going to help me in, in, a, in an effort? Well, make the world better. Eat healthier. Take a break when you're working at your desk. What can I say? I'm into holistics. There you go. Yeah. yeah I'll help get them out. Get some sunlight. Go out to the shooting range if you like guns and go fishing or do something, but help the environment. But whatever you do, you know, this, this planet has so many opportunities above and beyond. And if you don't believe it, look at Richard Branson. He was neither smarter nor better than any of us, but he's a mogul now. And like many entrepreneurs of his type. And uh, these people are phenomenal. So let's take example from them and then pay it forward the way they have. Share the knowledge, right? So what do they? What does your audience know that we can use to help improve ourselves? Yeah, that's I know that sounds like this for. big. Yeah, that sounds like this big soft whatever. But at the end of the day, I can't take anything from the people you know. I'm simply trying to give back to them, but they can continue giving back to our community. That is, um, that's a great way for people to look at it. I mean, really, by becoming your best self. So um, I want to thank you for the interview. It's good content, uh, especially the <laughs> stories about the Middle East and thinking bigger. You know, really not limiting ourselves to anything. Yeah. And uh, do you have a Twitter handle that you get on or a Facebook page yeah. that people can uh, give a shout yeah. out and say thanks for? I appreciate that, yeah. Um, I'm at, uh, at, for Twitter, I'm at Tanner K, so T A N E R K A Y. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, just type my full name to Google. Actually, I, I dominate, I believe, the first 15 pages of myself, and I'm not the only Turkish person with my name. I'm actually competing against a musician right now, and he's Christ, he's got so many followers. Um, the one thing that I would say is if you guys want to use anything as an example of what success looks like, just look at Dubai. You don't even have to go there. They have the world's tallest building. They have the world's only seven-star hotels. They have palm-shaped islands in the middle of water. If you think things couldn't be done, or if you thought your problems were big, try building an entire palm-shaped island on in the middle of a gulf yeah. in the Middle East with the kind of work, with the kind of environments, the kind of you know setups that are there. So... You can do it. Anyone can do it. So look at that. There's just so much out there for people to do. But uh, come connect to me if you, if anybody has questions about the Middle East, how to run a business or start one up there. I've got a lot of insights, and I'd love to help. Thanks, Tanner. Great conversation. Thank you, Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You. Bye.